that because of the horrible omnibus budget, they call it omnibus, but because of the recent budget, it's going to go up another $2 trillion. So we can't have $21 trillion in debt and protect Saudi Arabia and everything we touch, we lose money on. You know, we lose money on every single thing except student loans. Student loans. And the poor students are getting killed. No, no, the students are getting killed, by the way. It's the only thing. It's practically, it's one of the, it's one of the few things that we actually make money on as a government. But, which is, you know, the whole thing is ridiculous. But we have to change our whole way of thinking. Because otherwise, we're not going to have a country left. We're not going to have anything left. You're talking about the Chinese a while ago. The Chinese and the Islamists are killing us in cyber warfare, both economically and from a national security standpoint. How does a commander-in-chief, Donald Trump, win the cyber war? Well, the cyber war is so, I mean, you're talking about a whole new form. You look at what's happening with us right now, where they're taking our secrets. Of course, they're probably getting, you know, the emails of Hillary Clinton. Do you believe? <laughs> no, you believe that. You believe that. I mean, look at the fighter, the F-35, the new fighter, and then all of a sudden China comes out with a fighter. It's almost like identical. The color, you know, the whole thing, the shape is like, I say, what are you talking about? Did you see the two pictures of theirs and ours? It's almost identical. They obviously got it, and supposedly they stole it from us. Look, we have to be so careful. We have to be so smart. We have to be, and you have areas right now in South Carolina where cyber is going to be a very big and important factor because you have the key... You know, in this whole country, this is where it's at. This is going to be so important. And that's going to be one of our most, because the world is changing. The world is changing. That's going to be one of our most important sectors right there is in the military way. The cyber is so important. But you look at what's happening with Russia. You look at what's happening with China and how they're trying to get all of our secrets. Can't let it happen. So it will be very important. You've come out very strong against Common Core. Why is Common Core bad? Because you have to educate your children locally. I've seen it. You can't. You can't. You can't have bureaucrats from Washington. I'm, I'm sure some of them care, but for the most part, they don't. You can't have bureaucrats from Washington taking care of the education of your children. And I've seen local education where the parents are on the school boards and everything. It's, it's beautiful. Even when their children graduate, they stay and they, they have, they, there's love, there's total love. The other way, it's just a big bureaucracy. And there's another reason, if you look, we are ranked number 30 in the world in education. We spend more money per pupil than anybody else by a factor. You look at uh, Denmark, Sweden, Norway, China. These are the places that are really top of the line. But we spend, right now, we spend much more per pupil than any other country in the world by, by a factor where second place doesn't even exist. It's so far behind, okay? Spend more, and yet we're number 30. It's a little bit like on the election, you know, in New Hampshire, which I won by a big margin, uh, which was good. They're, those people are great. They were so great. But think of this. So I spent $3 million. Bush spent $46 million. I came in first, he came in toward the bottom of the pack. Wouldn't it be nice if we could do that as a country? Wouldn't that be nice when you think about it? And so in education, we spend the most and we're doing terribly. We're way down at the bottom of the pack. And uh, we can't have that. Education is so important. You know, the American dream is never going to happen unless we have great education. So important. What's your view of Social Security and what steps would you take to strengthen it? We're going to save it. We're going to bring our jobs back from all over the world, Mexico, from all over the world. And by the way, remember this. Remember I said it. It'll stop with me. But remember I said it. Mexico is the new China. You look at what's going on in Mexico, the big Ford plants all over the place. There was another article. I talked about the Ford plant for two years. Now there's an article two days ago in the Wall Street Journal where Ford is doubling up. They're going to have many, many more things are going down to Mexico. We're going to build the wall. Believe me, we're going to build the wall. The wall's going to be built. Wall's going to be built. And, and, who's going to pay for the wall? Mexico! Better believe it. And they are. You know, the politicians come off the stage. They say to me, and they're nice people, they're fine. They say to me, Donald, you know for a fact, I mean, give me a break. You know that Mexico's not going to pay. I said, of course they are. We have a trade deficit with Mexico that's so massive, the wall is peanuts by comparison. And I'm not even talking about the drugs that come pouring across the border illegally because you want to see real trade deficits. The drugs, we get the drugs, they get the cash. No good, no good, no good. 
Uh, you know, up in New Hampshire, where, where they have an amazing problem, because you look at New Hampshire, it's so beautiful in the woods and everything is so nice. And even then it was snowing. I said, please don't snow during the election, please. So it stopped. I got lucky. I said, please. Because, you know, it snows, you don't know. Maybe, I don't know. I think my people would come out, but you never know. And by the way, speaking to that, on Saturday, will you please come out and vote so we can... <laughs> so important. So important. Come out and go. We got to do that. You know, with, with all of everything that we're all working for, uh, we got to come out and vote and, and just win and win big. The bigger the mandate, like up there, we had a tremendous, with 36 percent, which is a lot. And, you know, that was a lot bigger than anticipated because we won by, I guess, like 20 points. And it's a tremendous mandate. And when you can do that here, and I tell you, we have the same feeling here. The people here are so incredible. And, and I know the people here from long before the whole electoral situation. I've had, I have so many friends in, in the area. And I love it. I love the place. But we have to come out and we have to vote. Saturday is such a big day. And if we can do Saturday, if we can do really well, we can literally run the table and we can win this whole thing and we can turn this country around and we can use common sense and make our country great again and make our country great again so but just a second and thank you i like that guy he stood up but just a second on social security so you know i see the other people and they're all saying you got to cut this you got to raise the age you got to do all of this there is tremendous waste like at the va there's tremendous waste fraud and abuse and everybody wants to get rid of that but we are going to bring all our jobs back. We're going to build our economy. We're going to become rich again. We're going to become strong again. And we're not going to cut Social Security. You've been paying into it forever. And it's unfair that you do it. And there's no reason to have to do it. And we're not going to do it. And I'm the only one that says that on this side. But we're not going to do it. How does tax policy look under a Trump administration? Well, we put in a very big policy paper, Van, and it's really what it is, is a massive simplification of what we have right now. Uh, you will not need H&R Block ripping you off anymore. You won't need anybody. You're not going to be paying a lot. It's simplification. The rates are much lower. We have four rates, and it's much, much lower. Middle class is going to be, as, as I told you before, going to be so much better. We have a problem in this country, and the problem is corporate inversion, which the politicians know nothing about, where we have corporations, you know, Pfizer is leaving for Ireland. I don't know if you've seen that, but Pfizer is a major company. They're leaving for Ireland. Many, many companies are leaving the United States for two reasons. Taxes are too high, and the other one is they have billions and billions of dollars, two and a half trillion dollars to be exact, probably a lot higher than that, two and a half trillion dollars in other countries they can't bring the money back in. And it shows you how bad Washington is because every single, it, it's an amazing thing, every single politician practically, Democrat and Republican, want, they agree that the money should come back in. Who wouldn't agree? And they can't make a deal. That's where you need the leadership. You need a president that's going to sit them in a room and just grab them and cajole and do whatever you do and get it done. But they're leaving to get their money. They're leaving because they can't bring the money in. They're leaving to get their money, and they're leaving for lower taxes. We've got to work on that fast because we're going to lose a lot of our greatest corporations. When you lose Pfizer, and others have announced already, they're leaving the country. And they're leaving thousands and thousands of jobs behind. Great jobs, not the bad jobs that we're creating. We're now creating part-time jobs and bad jobs. You know, when you look at those phony reports, they're phony reports. We're, we're doing bad, bad jobs, lousy jobs. They're called bad jobs. They're lousy. And we're also doing part-time jobs. When you have companies like Pfizer leaving, those are great jobs. Those are high-paying, great jobs, important jobs. And these people are all out of work. Thousands of people are out of work. Same thing I can say this with Carrier. You look at when Carrier Air Conditioners moves into Mexico. You're losing, I guess it was 1,400 jobs at least that they're talking about. But those are good jobs. And now what are those people going to do? What are they going to do? And by the way, what I said about Carrier before, I mean that. Unless you do something like that, now you'll have the, the free market people. I call them, in many cases, the not-so-smart people, because we all want free markets. But the markets have to be fair. When China sends all its stuff over here, and we send them a fortune of money, and we send stuff over there, and they won't accept it. I have friends that are manufacturers. You can't do business in China. They, these are smart cookies. These are great manufacturers, great products. They send their stuff into China, and they get sent back. And then when they do get in, they have a huge, they call it a tariff. They have a huge tariff to pay in China. We don't do that. 
It's not fair. And then when China devalues, they're the king of devalue. I mean, they, they do it like great chess players, like grandmasters. They devalue their currency to a point. They have it down to an absolute science. It makes it impossible for our companies to compete with China. Japan has done an unbelievable job of devaluation. And our companies are having a hard time. I talk about a friend of mine who's an excavator. And he always buys Caterpillar tractors. Now he just put in a massive order for Komatsu tractors. And he said to me, they devalued the yen, Japan, to such an extent that I could no longer... He felt very badly, because he's always bought... He's a pretty big com you know, company. They've always bought Caterpillar, always. And now he's buying Komatsu tractors. And he feels bad. He said, I never bought this before. I said, are they good? Yeah, but they're not as good. But they're good. And they're good enough. But I had an obligation to my family, my company, my employees to buy where I could get the best deal. And he bought Komatsu tractors because of the devaluation of the yen. And take a look at what's happened to Caterpillar stock. You know, we just have leaders that don't get it, and we are getting killed on trade. I mean, if you think of it, we're getting killed everywhere. We're getting killed on trade. We're getting killed at the border. We're getting killed with the military. We, we, we can't beat ISIS. Can you imagine telling the name was, you mentioned Van, General Douglas MacArthur or General George Patton. Can you imagine telling them that we can't beat ISIS? They'd beat ISIS in about two days. But, you know, it's a different mindset. And it's honestly, in terms of somebody that really loves the country, it's so sad. That's why I'm doing this. It's so sad to watch. You, you talked about Pfizer going to Ireland. Uh, last fall, I believe you were critical of Boeing's decision to open up a facility in China. Uh, they've lost uh, market share to Airbus. Boeing is very important to the people in the low country. What's going on here, and how would President Trump deal with it? Well, I'd be concerned about Boeing here and Boeing in the United States period. Um, first of all, Iran got all of this money. And did you notice where they bought their airplanes? They bought 118 you know, big aircraft. And guess where they bought them? From Airbus. They didn't buy them from Boeing. So Iran has this money that we just gave them, and now they're on like a shopping spree, like you go to the store. And they went to the store, and they went to Airbus, not Boeing. I don't even think they bid it out with Boeing because they don't want to do business. Who would make a deal like this? It's just sick. So they bought 118 aircraft from Airbus, which is European. They went to Italy, bought tremendous. They're buying missiles from Russia. They're buying nothing from the United States. They shouldn't be buying missiles anyway, wouldn't you think? But they're buying missiles from Russia, but they're buying nothing from the United States. Now, here's where you have a little problem, maybe a big problem eventually. When China ordered airplanes, they made Boeing, as you probably know, buy, build, and they're building a massive, massive, huge aircraft plant in China. It's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And someday they're going to come to you, unless I'm president, and they're going to say, we're not going to need your plant anymore in South Carolina. Okay? We're not going to need your plant because we're going to have a plant that's going to be in China, and we're going to devalue our currency, and we're going to do all the things that they do better than anybody else because we don't have people that know how to play that game because we're foolish. And they're going to take your business away, or they're going to take a lot of your business away. So Boeing has to be very careful. In terms of, actually, you have to be very careful, more so than Boeing. But what China did is when they took that, they gave them a fairly big order. Not even that big of an order, but they gave them a fairly big order. And they want it all built. They want massive plants built in China. And they have the intellectual property. They took a lot of secrets away that Boeing would never give. And give and they took, now, they're going to steal those secrets anyway, so I don't even know it's a big deal, because they steal them anyway. You know, you talk about cyber, right? They take them anyway. But they took them. This way, they took them legally. At least they put it in a contract, all right? It's too bad Boeing has to do it. But you have to be careful because China is building a massive, you know, infrastructure for airplane manufacturing. And someday you're going to come and you're going to say, you know, I remember Trump. He was sitting on the stage with a very handsome man. And he said this was going to happen when Boeing announces they're going to not build anymore in South Carolina. So you have to be very careful. It's not that far off. Have to be very careful. And politicians aren't going to understand this, folks. It's January 2017. And let's say there's a President Trump in the White House. What's the first thing you would do to strengthen the United States relationship with Israel? Well, I think it would be automatically strengthened if, you know, I was the Grand Marshal of the Israeli Day Parade a number of years ago. Actually at a very bad time for Israel when a lot of people, it was actually dangerous to do it. But I've had a very, very strong relationship with Israel. I have a great relationship with the leaders of Israel. 
and i think that honestly i don't have